22nd mark, right, Pete? I think it seems to be at the 22nd <laughs> I, mark, which is I, I guarantee now. you this part's going to be in the live stream right now. Probably. Yeah. Thomas, <laughs> now, so, well, <laughs> if, for everybody that's watching this, ignore everything up until now, and we're now officially <laughs> starting. Welcome to Behind the Geeks, uh, the show for MSPs by MSPs and ex-MSPs, where uh, we talk about all thing MSPs and other stuff as well. And uh, I am joined by the legendary Richard Tubb, Pete Matheson, and Scott Riley. And uh, Richard is back in the saddle this week after a couple of weeks off in recovery and craziness. And uh, we are glad to have you back. And shout out to uh, Jason Kemsley for jumping in and helping and filling the shoes during that time. Uh, this week, we're going to kind of dive straight into the topic this week. It has been a heck of a, a week in the industry with the, the whole Log4j Java exploit popping out in the wild at the end of last week that has sent the industry and the world into a tailspin around cybersecurity because there is so many products that are affected by this particular problem and so much work that needs to be done all around the place. And so we're not going to dive into the tactical stuff around Log4j and, and all the query strings that, that do it and all that kind of stuff because it's above my pay grade nowadays. I have no idea about the, the, the exploit stuff. And there's people that have far better conversations about that. But we thought we'd just have an open conversation about the whole changing landscape of security and what we're seeing out across MSPs and how people are approaching the security conversations with clients and expectations and, and all of that stuff with clients so that we can just have a kind of keep that part of the conversation flowing, the business side of the conversation flowing, not the technical side of the conversation flowing. And uh, so I'm going to open it up to you guys uh, to start off with. Like it, it, everybody knows about it. It's um, like you, you must be hiding under a rock to not see it. The first thing I'm going to, I want to make a comment on that I thought was absolutely amazing this week is that this thing, as all cybersecurity events uh, seem to do, happened on a Friday-ish. Like, it kind of came out on a Friday-ish Saturday, and it's always the beginning of the weekend. Like, that's where the whole cybersecurity world lives on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. And, um, and, and what I'd noticed and what I saw and what I thought was absolutely phenomenal was the number of vendors, especially serving the MSP space, that had their incident plans kicked into gear really, really quickly and were out there communicating on the front foot to their client base over the weekend. Now, I don't know about all of you guys, but even just 12 months ago when I, when I look at the MSP industry and the vendors and, and five years ago when I was in it, that sort of didn't exist. Like if we had a, a, a zero-day exploit like this, it might be on a Friday, it might be like the next Wednesday we'd probably start hearing from vendors or the, the, maybe a week later or whatever. But this to me is, is like as much as people are, are kicking stinks against vendors and, and telling vendors to step up and whatnot – I honestly feel like they are here. And I've seen a bunch of vendors, not just one or two or three, a bunch of them like really step up here and really show that they've got really strong incident plans in place and incident response plans in place and teams in place to scale dealing with an issue of this magnitude. And I thought it was awesome to see. So I'm going to kick off with that kind of comment or, or observation. But if any of you guys kind of seen some some awesomeness that's out there or some some craziness or that, that you like to comment on to kind of bring to the attention of the... Yeah, I mean, we've, yeah. we've, we've, we've seen... I think a couple of ones uh, breaches spring to mind uh, this year, the, uh, and fairly recently ones. The the GoDaddy uh, breach uh, that we saw not so long ago it was maybe six weeks, two months ago now, wasn't it? And around the same sort of time, we saw the uh, Huntress uh, Huntress one as well. Yeah. yeah, and I was fascinated to see uh, around the whole communication piece here how those two companies dealt with it because both of them acknowledged the breaches, but. You need to go beyond acknowledging the breach at this point, don't you? You need to put it not in legal talk, but in terms that MSPs and consumers can understand. In other words, how does this affect you? What does need what needs to go on there? And I think there was it was like night and day the difference between how GoDaddy dealt with it, huge corporation, and how Huntress dealt with it. GoDaddy were like, "Oh yeah, this happened, and we're legally responsible for saying <laughs> this happened, and here's what happened, and that's it." And Huntress was like yeah, we're going to talk to you as a customer and we're going to say, this happened. Here's where we could have done things better. Here's what we've learned from it. And here's what you need to know about it right now, which at the end of the day was, you know, sort of very little action needed to be taken. But it was like night and day, wasn't it? And I think oh, yeah. to your point, Nigel, over the past year, we have seen the MSP industry especially just really mature in how vendors handle these things. And the final point I want to make on this is, I think the interesting uh, case about this specific breach that happened or this specific incident exploit. that happened is exploit, is that it's uh, it was across the board, wasn't it? It wasn't one company that was affected. Mm -hmm. So I do question, actually, if any one of those companies had been affected in isolation, would we have seen the same level of response from them? Because what I'm saying here is 
it affected loads of people. So did one vendor see the noise from another vendor who saw the noise from another vendor from another vendor and were like, crikey, we've got to do something <laughs> about this. So I don't want to pour cold water on it because it has been handled really well. But this has been one that's affected loads of people. How companies deal with a, a specific incident, I think, is the, uh, the litmus test going forward. And I think there's been some really interesting background to this as well. You know, the team that discovered it, you know, have been talking about it openly for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And actually, the first uh, I heard the first time that this vulnerability was talked about was actually back in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's something that has been kind of known around for a while. But actually, the team that discovered this thing was the team from Alibaba, um, and they started to make the real noises and go through the right channels to escalate this. And so it's been known about you know, in the community, that this is an exploit, but actually before the, the real sort of zero day public announcement happened, yeah. <laughs> um, most of these vendors were already aware, you know, and they had the opportunity to put those communication plans together, which I think is good. It's also a shame that I heard that some, some of those bad actors also got in on that advice sort of mm. nine days ahead of the public yeah, announcement. Before, so they yeah. also had the opportunity to launch. I think it was like over a million attacks over that first weekend, right. Um, right. including some state sponsored attacks as well. Right. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, this thing affects so many things. It was hundreds of millions of devices, switches, mm. uh, firewalls. I'm going to say routers uh, for the benefit of Nigel, because if I say the other one, it's, <laughs> it means something else in Australia. Um, this is a but, you know, server code. storage appliances. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's everything. And, and, and the funniest thing I heard that it's not just on this planet. It's also on Mars because actually the code is wow. used on right. Mars Rover. All right. So I'm like, wow, this is an intergalactic uh, attack <laughs> intergalactic. Or, or vulnerability, sorry. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I echo what you said, Richard. There's been some great responses from a lot of the vendors. Um, there's been some horrendous uh, <laughs> marketing pylons and ambulance oh, yeah. chasing. Well, if, yeah. if you'd have had my product, you wouldn't be vulnerable to log 4 j um, yeah, And I'm just, oh, come on, guys. But um, Ismail makes a great point, you know, the power of social media uh, forcing them to respond in the right way. And I think we've all come to expect so much more as as us as MSPs and, and you know, businesses have been put under the pressure from things like, you know, GDPR legislations and data privacy concerns. Now we're expecting more from our vendors and we're expecting far more transparency. And you can't just get away with, although AD West did this exact thing this week, you can't just get away with saying, uh, something went wrong and it was a bit unexpected, but we fixed it. It shouldn't have happened. Uh, it was really hard to fix, but it won't happen again. Uh, okay. <laughs> we, we, we can't have that when Thanks. it comes to a security concern. Um, so I, I think it's been great. I think the, the transparency has been really great. You know, it's going to be a difficult one to get over. There isn't just one fix mm. and one patch to get yeah. through this. So it is going to take some time. So again, it's a lot of work, I think, for the MSPs to keep looking out for their clients and looking out for um, their own infrastructure and just making sure it's it's as up to date as it possibly can be. Yeah, I, well, yeah. I think the um, the social media thing is quite an important one because, like you're saying, but beforehand it wasn't really being reported that much. I mean, we've seen like the other kind of threats that have come through being semi-reported, but I, I don't know what it is. But this time around, I mean, I was seeing the log the log kind of stuff announced in like, financial things and like on the general news and all these other kind of places that it wouldn't normally be talked about. Hmm. Um, whether that's because we're all just stuck at home and have nothing better to talk about, I don't know. <laughs> but um, it, it's definitely helped because the more people that talk about it, the more serious it's... I mean, it is serious, but the more serious it seems to be from everyone else that's involved. And then the more focused the vendors you know, put on putting the fixes out. I've seen so much going around you know, from the uh, the guys of Hostify. Like they've, they've had to deploy a ton of updates across oh, all yeah. their infrastructure. Yeah. That's been, I mean, that, that must be a task in itself, trying yeah. to push those mm -hmm. out. Um, and communicate it with your clients, you know, setting expectations on downtime and scheduling windows and all those kind of things. That's that's a huge undertaking. Um, and that's just one company out of, you know, all the other kind of billions that are out there trying to do this. Like Amazon, didn't Amazon have a blip like the other day as well? I think that, that had a few issues. Oh, yeah, they were out for uh, half a day on East Coast or West Coast or something, I think. Was, was, yeah, and was Coast, that related? Yeah. I, I don't know if that's related or if that's something uh, another one. No, it was to do with their auto scaling infrastructure. But they, again, they're the ones who said, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> something went well. wrong that shouldn't have gone wrong and uh so yeah they they literally they had to, funnily enough they had to rely on logs to be able to figure out what happened and why it happened uh but no it wasn't it wasn't related to this uh incident one of the things i want to point out here i was gonna i was gonna ask about if, the, if the mars rover is okay because <laughs> thinking with my msp's hat on that is a hell of a journey to go to to reboot like a router or something. <laughs> 
It's just, play, it's just playing on my mind. I need to make tape. I'm, roll, I'm rolling the truck to, to go out there and get that job done. Who's the field engineer? Someone's got to go out with a USB stick. <laughs> yeah, you'll be back in nine years. Nine years. Um, round trip. The thing I want to call out on this one, which I'm seeing as well, which I think is amazing, is is as the, the MSP vendor landscape is starting to, to realize how much the MS, MSPs want and need this great levels of communication you've got the the front runners like right out the front that are really setting the example and i'm, I'm going to call huntress out here as being one of those front runners who in my opinion is doing an absolutely phenomenal job of setting the standards for how vendors should communicate during this process as richard said before when there was that night and day incident between how how they did it when they they actually had a, a, a minor security incident inside their business but in and when i saw that particular thing i called it out on one of our other um episodes mm. i called it out because it just blew my mind as to how quickly they were able to get together not not, not only do have an incident response but have one that was so well worded and so comprehensively approached and everything in there that it, it had to have been planned in advance which is the, the best part about the whole thing and what's what's going to happen now is all these other vendors and all you MSPs out there can see these amazing examples that you can take inspiration from to start to go and build your own incident response plans in here and how to how to attack these things and what type of language to use when talking to your clients and how transparent to be without losing reputation. And you'll see that the transparency levels are, are ridiculously deep that companies like Huntress are going to. And they're not losing reputation. They are gaining reputation by being that transparent in there, by showing the dirty, nasty, horrible stuff behind the scenes that led to this stuff and led to their own incident breaches. And and I am seeing comments after comments after hundreds of comments with people saying, like, after reading that, that made me want to work with Huntress more, not less, after they had a security breach. And that, to me, is phenomenal. And it's, and it's awesome because every MSP that's in the world should be watching that now and every vendor out there should be watching how they're doing it and using it as inspiration for their, their own uh, communications and their own incident response plans. I think it, it's absolutely phenomenal. It kind of blows my mind. I'm, I'm jealous that someone can put together, like Kyle can put together a company that can operate at that level really quickly and be so agile to throw that stuff together. I'm in awe of how they do it. It's, it's phenomenal, if you ask me. Yeah, I wanted to make a point about that, the the trust. So I think the big lesson is nothing to do with cybersecurity or, you know, anything along those lines. But for MSPs who uh, are watching these incidents unroll, as you said, Nigel, we saw this in the tribe, didn't we? The feedback on the Huntress breach and how they handled it was incredible. I would actually say Huntress have come away from that stronger in their relationships with partners and with external parties than not having a breach. So there's an interesting point, and go down to the opposite <laughs> side of that scale. So there's an interesting point there. It's nothing to do with cybersecurity, but it's everything to do with trust and transparency. For MSPs that are watching, be aware that if you make a mistake, the sooner you own it, hold your hands up and say, here's how it affected you. Here's how we're going to make it right. Here's what we're doing to stop it from happening again in the future. It goes an incredible long way to building trust. Because if you have friction, it builds the trust up if you handle the friction well. If you don't have any friction, as we've learned in the MSP space, clients are, are often uh, liable to turn around if they don't see any pain at all to go, what is it I'm paying you for? Uh, so if you have some sort of friction, it's really good if you handle it in the right way. So I think that's the lesson for, for MSPs from this. Uh, and I think certainly with all the MSPs I speak to and, and even like clients when I've spoken to them before, the one biggest issue that they have is communication with MSPs. Mm. It's either too much because they're getting spammed with tickets and all the updates and all those kind of things, or it's like most commonly next to Frigates. nothing. Like things are happening, you know, they'll raise tickets, they'll raise an issue, and then it just kind of disappears into nothing. And they don't know if it's been fixed and who's, do, who's doing what. So I think it's so, so important that you can fix a lot of your problems just by talking to your clients and yeah. just say, this has happened. This is what we're doing about it. This is when you'll get the next update. I think that's an important one because when you have these kind of big outages and big kind of issues you can say this has happened we're gonna fix it don't worry and then that's it and goes quiet <laughs> but actually if you say we're gonna check in with you every day or yeah, every yeah. 12 hours i mean just to let you know where we are you know much like our, our vendors do with us when there's big outages we'll let you know every half an hour even if and it knows it's annoying in that half an hour there is no update and you go there is no further update we're still working on the issue yeah. But at least you're staying in that regular touch with with the clients. Um, that's such an important thing. It's so easy to fix, and you just need to put someone in charge of that, like that role of the communication. Like while the engineers are off fixing and doing all the things, just have that one person. If you've got the staff there to say, 
you're in charge of the communication on this this kind of project or this this issue. Um, you must send out an update through your um, you know CRM system, whatever it is, every half an hour or every hour, or agree it with your clients, and then they are responsible. And they just talk to the engineers and say, right, where are we? Okay, cool. I'll communicate it, and they kind of run with that. I think that's such an easy thing for a lot of MSPs to do. And quite often, the best person to do that is not the techs. There's someone else, yeah. you know, in an admin part of the role, a salesperson, <laughs> a marketing person, uh, the owner of the business. Sometimes, sometimes not, uh, because it's just it's someone that needs to communicate in human speak, not in tech speak. And and God love us techs, but sometimes we speak too much in tech speak out there, and not enough human speak in there. And that's what clients really want, right? Is they just want to be able to understand something very easily. And that's what I think some of these vendors have done an amazing job of is just put it into that real human speak in there and, and put personality behind it. Richard, There's something you've... to be said here about as well. I think it was like, it was eight years plus ago that Gary Vaynerchuk said, all companies are media companies. Now, I'm not a great fan of Gary Vaynerchuk, <laughs> but he speaks a lot of sense and a lot of wisdom. I can see Nigel was like, what? You don't love Gary V? Oh, no, um, no. I was I was trying to imitate him. He's, he's bloody... <laughs> right. Right. Uh... <laughs> But the point is, like, there's also an opportunity here. Like, if you make a mistake, you own up to it. You say how you're going to fix it. But there's also an opportunity to, to then show behind the scenes. Here's what we are doing to make sure this doesn't happen again. Here's the impact it had on us. You know, you could show people running around, oh, we've got to get this fixed. Here's how we fixed it. Here's what it looks like now. And it's that behind the scenes stuff that also builds trust between MSPs and clients or vendors and MSPs. So to your point, Pete, where you were like, okay, it's all fixed and then it just goes quiet. There's a real opportunity here for the vendors to say, here's what it looked like in our data center. Here's what it looked like in our dev team. Here's what it looked like on our management meetings. Here's what it looks like three months later after that incident. By the way, we haven't forgotten about that. We're not just reacting to the next one. We are working behind the scenes. And I think, you know, all companies are media companies now. That media might make people feel a bit uncomfortable sort of showing a camera behind the scenes, but it's super, super powerful for building up trust. Mm, yeah. And it helps people see the thought process that goes on behind things. And that's what I really loved about the Huntress one when they were talking about their incident breaches. They were not only going through and just describing it in human detail, but they were describing their thought process as they were making decisions through this so that you could see the yeah. the the way that they were reasoning, they went through the process and how they had the conversation with their lawyer about how much they should disclose and how they made decisions to go against that. And they were just, just going through behind that process was an incredible lesson just for, it wasn't only reassuring for people reading it to know that they've got things under control, but it's also a lesson in how to think through these processes because these guys were thinking at an amazing level in there. And um, and I think it was amazing. Scott, you you mentioned in there that you want to have a quick bit of a conversation about um, how how do we like this whole security landscape is just madness right at the moment like it's just a, a crazy world and it's very hard for small nimble msps to keep up with the whole thing how does the whole msp slash mssp slash sock kind of thing play out now at the moment and and when does it become too much for an msp to handle and, and where does the line get drawn between needing to, to have the services of a sock or a, an mssp or whatever in your your thing and so Scott, I know you work a little, like you're, you're on the front lines far more than the, the other three of us at the moment. So you've probably got the best um, advice or, or input on that one. What are, you, what are you seeing in that space at the moment in terms of where to draw the line and when to call in for help versus trying to do it all on your own and trying to be the, the MSB jack of all trades in there? No, and I, th I think that's exactly it. It's, it's the trying to do everything yourself because, you know, the... The security landscape keeps changing so much. And when we look at things like that happened this week with Log4j or Logforge, depending on which, mm. which side of the fence you sit on for that, um, what, it, what it makes me think is that, you know, so many MSPs are not just like the one man and the five man shops, but even like the 50 and 100 man shops still don't have like a dedicated SOC team. Yeah. You know, they, they might have great field engineers, they might have great service desk, they, you know, they're fantastic teams, but they don't have a dedicated SOC because security has always been one of those things where, We'll do our best with the tool sets that we know. And we'll protect our customers in the best way within the bounds of what we know. But there's so much that we don't know. And, and you know, you, you get into these situations where you have, you know, co-managed services with clients where they have access to the firewall and you have access to the firewall. And, you know, you look after their antivirus and their backups. And is that enough? Is your, is your security stack enough? when what's actually happening is we're seeing all these different things from different tools all over the place. And it isn't your RMM system that's going to pull it all together. It isn't your PSA tools that's going to go, oh, do you know what? You have you know, your firewall and your switches, your routers, and your Office 365, and some serves in AWS and Azure. And all of that stuff's got to go somewhere. And what used to be 
only for the big boys in those SOC and SEAM services, now applies to, to organizations of all sizes. And that means that it applies to MSPs of all sizes. And I just don't think that the, the smaller MSPs, and, and, I, and I do mean like up to like 50 man shops, so still like smaller MSPs, but still it's big, you know, it's a lot of people. I don't think we're set up to cope for that. I think you have to look at this and go, we, we need a partnership or we need a security yeah. operations team. And you can either build it in-house. It's the same old, you know, buy or build. You can, you can try and do it yourself. You can try and learn it. You can hire some clever guys. You can have one or two clever guys who are really good at it, or you can partner out. And I think for the, for the cost and the development and the expertise to get that going in these smaller shops, it's such a burden. But I don't think that we can keep running away from it. I've genuinely oh, worked, course, you know, yeah. with and for lots of MSPs who've just kind of got security. Oh, the old uh, Drake. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just don't think we can anymore. And yeah. I think, you know, there's we've we've talked about this in the tech tribe. There's there's liability waivers. There's letters that we can write to the clients and say, hey, we just don't feel like you're taking it seriously. So we're not going to be your MSP anymore. Or when we're bidding for business, look, you're not prepared to pay for the basic security services. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to take on this contract for these reasons. And I just think we also need to mature and step up. And I'm sure there's some MSPs listening like, hey, we have a SOC and we have a SEAM, we've got yeah, this sorted. Yeah, yeah. But I would bet that there's a huge amount of the audience that's listening that just yeah, go, yeah, I get it. It's, yeah. we have our stack, it's in, it's in good shape, but it's still bloody hard for us to manage that at scale across all the customers when yeah. unexpected things come along. Um, Pete, you make a great point. You know what? What? What is the difference between an MSP and an MSSP, and and how do you get into that mindset? I guess. Yeah, the um, the MSSP is the, an interesting conversation because I've seen a lot of MSPs call themselves an M MSS mm. MSSP, mm. but it's that defining what what makes you the. Do you self declare it? Is it oh a yeah, you're <laughs> they do. <laughs> it's all self declared. It's, it's, it's because <laughs> they they have next gen AV. Most of them, and that, that, that turns them into an MSSP. And that also li links into another um, question I had the other day. Of um, certainly, in, when I was running the MS, my MSP, it was layering, like layering products to make sure you have got adequate protection. But w what are you guys? What, what are your thoughts around? Do, is that do you still need layering products? Do you just find the one best of breed products and go with that? Um, you know, when, when you when you're talking about the the various ways into your network and into like infections and viruses and ransomwares and all the hacks and stuff. Where, where do you go? Do, do you still try and get that kind of two or three layers? Yeah, I think, it, it, I think defense in depth is always a fantastic approach to security. And generally again, inside, you know, the smaller MSPs, you'll see them stick to the same vendors that, so that they build up their expertise that they know and trust. Um, and that way, you know, you'll have you know the firewalls, you'll have your endpoint management, you'll have your antivirus and email hygiene, and you'll have your web content filtering, and all those things kind of sit inside that stack along with backup and hopefully some end user training, because obviously being one of the, <laughs> the the weakest parts of the of the chain. Um, but I think you know that can still be a challenge because some some people are declaring themselves MSSPs because they use a certain next gen firewall, and that next gen firewall gives them a badge and says, "Hey, you're now an MSSP." <laughs> Are you though? You know, when we look at things like that have happened this week, you know, if, if any of our clients have lost money because of some of their services happening here, are we an MSSP? And and I just think there's a there's a speciality here. When I when I'm I simply look at our business and go, hey, do you know what? We don't do dynamics and we don't do power BI and things like that. And I would look at security operations and say, we don't do that. We we are great at securing the environment. Yeah. But we, you know, we're looking at this this piece of the puzzle here. For a holistic piece that touches every single device that you have, we need to use a security operations center, um, and we have an outsourced option for that. You know, we do, I'm not doing a sales pitch there, but I think the other part of this that's interesting that you touched on, Pete, that that Richard, I think you'd like to talk about is what about consolidating down you know again I, I i'm a big microsoft advocate so we're trying to consolidate down look don't use third-party antivirus and mail filtering and now um even web content filtering because all of that is built into 365 and defender is that a good thing i'm kind of putting all our eggs into one basket and i think that's a good thing but richard what what, what do you think when it comes to consolidation that way yeah it's really interesting so um before i was off the show ill uh, the two weeks before that, I was actually traveling and doing a bit of speaking. And I was I was speaking at the uh, Acronis uh, CyberFit Summit in uh, Switzerland, in Schaffhausen. Brilliant. But Acronis are one of these uh, companies that are working towards um, 
consolidating different tools. So they t coined that term cyber protection. So you've got cybersecurity and you've got BDR, put them together, cyber protection. Now, I think this is where a lot of the industry will be headed because you can't just have a tool in isolation, can you? They've got to be together. Now, the next question then comes up, you know, your BDR, your cyber uh, security and that, do you have them from the same vendor? Mm. There's... Uh, uh, definite uh, advantages to having that. So in old terminology, what we used to say back in the day when we were selling managed services to a client is, oh, you've got one throat to choke. So if something goes wrong with anything that's got a plug on it, you call us, you choke us, and we're going to get it fixed for you. Uh, so there is that uh, uh, idea that, look, if anything goes wrong with your stack, You've got one vendor to call, and it's not a case of them saying, oh, yeah, you need to speak to those guys, or you need to speak to those guys, or we were safe, and it was the API, blah, 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 blah. No, we pay the bill to you, you get this sorted, and you tell us where it went wrong. So there's the advantage there, and I think there's advantages from security. There's probably pricing advantages. But for all of those things said, do you really feel comfortable with all of your eggs being in one basket with one single supplier? I'm not saying either way here. Um, you know, what's best, but there's a lot of arguments to and fro. And I'm speaking to a lot of MSPs. I was doing an interview yesterday with a lady on a Tub Talk, my podcast, and they've consolidated on like a single cybersecurity vendor. So it's interesting. Oh, wow. the, and there is a split going in the industry between people who are like, we're going to use best of breed from whoever versus we're going to consolidate with a yeah. single vendor or maybe two vendors. Yeah. Now, I, consolidation. I think, oh, sorry, you go, Pete. I think the thing here is that you, you've got vendor consolidation, which they're basically choosing their best of, well, say best of breed. They're, they're bringing the various products together and they're buying and acquiring companies and integrating it. The, the thing that I always think about is that they're acquiring companies partly based on the quality of the product, but also probably based on profit margins because there are lots of VC funds, you know, investing. True. So it's not always yeah. the best products. Yep. And uh, that's the argument against going for that. Yeah, and actually yeah. say, no, I'm, I'm going to go out and find the best products here, here. as long as it integrates with my whole kind of ecosystem of yeah. all my other products and vendors. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. just a word of, I guess, one word of warning against uh, trying Agreed. to centralize yeah. everything. That that is my my like I'm a fan of that approach as well because at at the kind of like we look at the cybersecurity industry at the moment and it's not mature yet. It's still got years and years and years to mature to the point where consolidation actually makes sense and everything's integrated. And so at the moment, when when you look at um, all the like the NIST framework or the sys controls or whatever, and you look at all the different things that they suggest you cover, there is no vendor that covers all of those things well out there. There's some vendors that try to because they started off with one amazing part of the product. It might have been AV or whatever it is. And then, as Pete said, try to buy in different things because they had some VC money or PE money in there. Um, but they're in that kind of immature phase at the moment. And, and I don't feel we're at a state at the moment where you can rely on single vendor yet out there. I think you've got to go out and look for, as Pete said, the, the best tool for the particular job to, to look after that particular area of whatever you're covering in the NIST frameworks or whatever it is that you're aligning with or the cyber essential or essential aid out here or cyber essentials over yeah. there or whatever it is. And, right, um, and just go for the best tool for the job for now, knowing that consolidation is going to happen like crazy in this space over the next five to 10 years. And integration is going to get faster and better and stronger and tighter and whatever. I just think it's right now, very immature in all those integrations, like very immature right now. And there's so much opportunity right. for it to change. You just got to keep an eye on it and, and not be like, like chase those, those things where you are kind of reducing the throats to choke down because it's so much easier to have, as Richard said, like those single things. But I don't think we're there yet where we do can have a single, but like as an MSP, you can't have a single choke the throat. Choke to throat. <laughs> throat to choke. <laughs> in there. Um, I think as well, I think this this is a good time for, for MSPs to really look at their security stack and really look at what they, like hand on heart, what are we good at? What can we be yeah. good at? And, you know, what is... Yeah. What's core? What can we develop on? And then have those conversations with your client. Um, Ismail made a great point earlier, which is like when we talked about the the additional security, and, the, and he's like, "Yeah, good luck getting them to pay extra." Um, and I think, yeah, absolutely. Try, try and get a client to pay for Office three sixty five back over. That's that's the most basic of things. And you're like, no, we don't want to pay the extra one pound fifty. Um, what what it makes me think is that it's it's a good time to reflect. You know, with this constant changing security landscape. What do you do? What's in your stack? What could you outsource and partner with and have you know, an additional tier of service? But then go and have those conversations with the client that just go, look, realistically, here's where you are. If something like this was to happen and you were to get breached, we're not responsible. You might think that we are, but we're not. 
And so I just want to call it out to you. And this is a horrible conversation to have, and I'm not suggesting that this is the right way to do it, but it, that conversation needs to be had with those clients to set the expectations that this is what we do, this is what we're responsible for. If you don't have cybersecurity insurance, then you, you could be in for a big shock if something happens. If you don't choose to take out this security service, and it sounds like you're trying to sell them on fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and just get them into a higher price point. But if you just say, hey, what, this, is, this is what we do. If that's not good enough, we do have another layer of service here and, and make sure that you've got that built out. And again, you know, whether that's through a partnership, and I'd, I'd expect if you're a smaller shop, then a partnership is the right answer. Somebody like InSoc or Uptime or some of those guys that have those services. Um, Bruce makes a great point here. It says paying extra to protect your business is a no-brainer. It absolutely is, Bruce, but you, you'll have that conversation with some of those clients who just don't want to pay a penny more. IT is an expense. It's a cost. And you just, you struggle to get through to me. Guys, these hacks that we're seeing on, you know, on 365 tenants that are happening weekly now, you know, I can cite the number of, of clients that I've seen who have, you know, lost 6,000 pounds here and 10,000 pounds there. And I think you, you make a great point, you know, about getting them to sign a disclaimer. It's having this conversation that says, this is what we do. And if you are happy with that and you don't want anything further, here's a waiver, here's a disclaimer. I need you to sign off that we are not responsible if you get hacked. And that will kind of, you know, force a switch in their head to go, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you, what do you mean you're not responsible? You do our IT. Yeah. And I'm telling you that we are not responsible if you get hacked under these circumstances. So it's, it's, I think it's just a great time to have that conversation with the clients. Um, given the background of everything that's happening, breaches are just a daily occurrence now. So it should be a, a good conversation to have. But you have to be honest about what you can do inside your own stack and what you should partner up for. Yeah, yeah. And, th and those liability disclaimer templates, we've got a, a, a base level one that you can use inside the Tech Tribe. If anybody is not a Tech Tribe member and you want a copy of it, just email help at thetechtribe.com and ask the guys and they'll send it to you. We don't, like, I'd rather people just have that in their hands. Um, but, however, comma, uh, those things are being shown, like liability disclaimer templates and whatever, are starting to be shown up and um, and dismissed in courts around the world now, especially mm -hmm. in the US, which is more of a litigious area than than us in the UK or yeah. you guys in the UK and us in Australia. But they are starting to to be dismissed as not enough to, to convince people and the MSP still being found at fault, unfortunately, as much as we don't want it to be like that. But what they do and what, to Scott's point, is that they, they also just help show the client that's making potentially a bad decision that you guys actually do take this stuff seriously and it can become a sales tool and a mindset shifting tool to that person to go ah like if they're going to this level to make me want to sign a piece of paper maybe i am making a bad decision here and and before they were just telling at me like barking at me to do it but now they're literally getting me to sign something official i probably do need to change my stance on these things here and so they can be used very helpfully as a a sales tool be careful using them as a reduction of liability tool because some some jurisdictions they're, they're not being held up too well out there uh we've got a screen share here on um how do i click this button to get a screen oh there we go um yeah so I'll talk about this. So I, I, I did a piece of work recently on, um, it was a Vance and Bourne uh, survey of about 400 MSPs worldwide. And, you know, we're talking about uh, cybersecurity and um, how MSPs are reacting and to the, to the future of it. It's a really good survey. It was done in, in um, conju conjunction with Channel Pro magazine. I'd encourage you to check it out. Anyway, I wrote a blog post about my sort of insights from it. But the interesting uh, piece that we've just been talking about is MSPs struggling to justify increased costs to clients based on cybersecurity. We've had loads of comments, Barry talking about it, coming back to uh, communication, Bruce talking about communication, yep. you know, so on and so forth. But 59% of MSPs who were surveyed, and we're talking globally here, we're not talking a handful in the US, this is from people all over the place. 59% of MSPs said, we really struggle to justify to our clients why they've got to have new security tools because the clients say to us, and we all know this listening to this, the clients say, well, wasn't that covered anyway? And so you're like, ah, yeah. And the best answer I've seen for this so far is from a tech driver, actually. It's from Ernst Murray. And he does packages. He's MSP packages, doesn't he? I think, Nigel, in like 2020, yeah. 2021, yeah. quarter one, and things like that. Yeah. So I think it's a great way of going because we all know what was fit for purpose last uh, month, last year, may not be fit for purpose now. And so if you're actually uh, putting dates on your packages saying, well, you've got the Q1 2021 package, when the client said, well, why do we need that? Well, things have moved along. And I think a great example of this, do you remember the early days we were doing this show and I had the PC here 
Uh, and I was like, look, this is a, a kick-ass PC. It's really, really good. Um, and it kept crashing. I was like, well, what's going on? And then I checked into it. My PC was like eight years old. I was like, and it didn't occur to me once that I was like, holy cow, this PC is eight years old. We all do it, though. We learn to live with what we've got in front of us. We don't ever question why we need to upgrade until we're forced to upgrade. And so I think the idea of sort of naming those packages and saying what was good for last month, not so good for this month. Yeah. Well, hang on. I'm just copying the, the URL in here because Ismail asked to share the URL to that thing. So I've just pasted yeah. it across yeah. there for you, Ismail. Um, yeah, that... Oh, sorry. The, the thing I was going to say on that is 100% is that it, it's start, like everybody's saying it in the chat box and everything. It is it is so much about communication and education. It's not funny right now. And we're going to beat that drum until we we bleed it in the hands, I suspect, that, that the whole industry needs to just drastically double down on communication and education with clients because that's where these conversations become easier. And pre-framing that there is going to be the, the, this IT support game is now a moving target. It's not like you're going to lock into a a thing and your, your stack is now going to be the same for the next three years because that's not possible and it's detrimental to your business nowadays. We need to, to, to always be talking to every client saying, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Client, let's have these conversations now that, that the goals are going to change. The landscape is going to change. There's these hacking teams over in Russia and all these countries that are, are creating new ways to do things all day, every day and coming up with new things. And so we're in a war now where we've got to, we've got to adapt and we've got to be adaptable and you need to be adaptable as a business owner. And we need to be here to coach you through that process and help you understand the risks that happen through that particular thing. And as part of that, we're going to have uncomfortable conversations in the coming years, but that's our job as your, your provider here to be, to bring you into those uncomfortable conversations. And we expect you to turn up to them with an open mind and a, and I'm not going to say open wallet, but sometimes you need an open wallet too, when you turn up with those things, but that communication piece, oh my goodness, like I'm going to beat it until the cows come home, but it is so ridiculously darn important. Communication and pre-framing is so darn important at the moment. And, um, and yeah, there you go. End rant. I guess that's why <laughs> things like regulation actually could have a positive impact on the industry. Because actually, if you're regulated and have regulated MSPs, then you actually you, you know you're working with MSPs that can do the right job. They are an MF, MSSP because they've been certified under regulations or what have you. That's a positive I can see. Yeah. Richard, are you... Do you, you Oh, sorry, you go. No, you go, Pete. I was going to talk about uh, I was going to say, uh, maybe we can do a quick five minutes on, do you want to build a stack? Because I know, it, not necessarily build it, but just touch on the, the errors that you need. Because something I find with a lot of people I speak to when I'm kind of running through things, they're like, oh, I, I didn't even think of that. I didn't cover that you know, attack vector or whatever it was. So without getting kind of really into the weeds, is it worth just running around the room and touching on each each area, maybe mentioning some vendors' names on people where they can check them out you can give people some out. shout outs on here and expect our commission checks in the mail no problem <laughs> <laughs> so um scott you i think you've, you've already written a list in, in the document we work for but if i start off the top so in terms of like building out security stack um mfa what what are the go-to providers for for mfa for when for, for your clients microsoft any other kind of thoughts around because i know there are some designed to work at the like the msp level that help you kind of work yeah, with there's, clients. Like, there's like duo and keeper and and last pass that yeah. now have mfa sitting in it now and there's a mikey as well isn't there, mikey is another one yep. there is yeah yeah the, uh, mikey's actually really good uh we've just been yeah. trying that recently what one of the things i like about that is that the fact that it's completely decentralized so there isn't right. a central database that could get hacked so one of the the risks around the other you know cloud single password sharing and, and mfa tools like that is that there could be a central database that gets hacked at some point and we've all seen that happen where we go well they're the vendor their database is never going to get hacked <laughs> okay um so mikey have taken the opposite approach which is everything's decentralized so you can still kind of have like your msp um library of, of passwords and mfas that you can share with people and you can revoke access when you need to um and you have your personal vault um but yeah, I, I'm finding it a really good tool. Not an advert for my key, but genuinely we're, we're using it, finding it really, really useful yeah, for that reason. Cool. Mo moving um, on, web filtering. Um, Richard, I'll throw this over to you. What uh, vendors do you know that do web filtering? Oh, so many at the moment, isn't there? I think uh, Barracuda have got a solution that's out there. There's, uh, I, I mean, I'm really intrigued. I don't want to sort of bounce this back, but I'm really intrigued to see in the chat what people are using and finding valuable because I could just list off. In fact, we've got on the blog, like list of, uh, web filtering tools and that there's so many out there and you know i can speak to the company's uh culture and the ones that i would recommend you deal with but the startups coming out 
almost every week, it feels like now. I know Barracuda acquired Scout for email security uh, recently. There's all these acquisitions. And to the point Nigel made earlier, you know, um, you can't really at the moment cover all your bases with one vendor. But the market is consolidating so quickly. And you would have thought that's going to narrow the choices. It's not because there are startup companies every week with new products that are coming out there. So I hope that's not a cop out because I could sit here for the next 10 minutes just listing tools. But I'm really intrigued to see what, what people out in the real world are using and recommended at the moment. Nigel, good, let's throw it to you for email hygiene. Sorry, were you going to throw it to me? Email hygiene? Let's throw it to you for email hygiene. Say so email filtering vendor wise. Uh, I'm I hear good report. And so we, we obviously we're office 365 and we have very limited, um, very limited usage. So we just do with the ATP part of office 365 for our email filtering inside the tech tribe. But um, I'm hearing in terms of the MSP space with clients, I'm seeing people use proof point, I think is one of the big ones that uh, people right. are having a lot of success with. Um, Barracuda has got another offering. I believe that people are having success with there's a, a Cisco one, Richard, you might know the name of the Cisco one that people are using. I can't remember the name of that one. Um, yeah, but I, I am the we, last we used to have like open DNS, wasn't it, back in the day? But yeah, you're oh, uh, umbrella. 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 Yeah, umbrella. Yeah, umbrella. But that's more yeah, on the yeah. DNS filtering side, I think, versus the email mm. sanitization side of things. There's um Graphus. There's that, that startup Graphus, G R A P H U S. That's um yeah, we coming use Graphus that. internally, actually. Do you? Because yeah. right. they have Graphus a while ago. Yeah. Did they? Right. That one's popping up in, and I'm seeing it pop up. I'm I'm hearing a few reports about that one still being in the kind of initial. They're, like they're learning and they're growing and whatever. And there's there's a few other bugs or limitations in the platform, but but I'm seeing them make a few big waves in the marketplace. Um, but I, I am the last person to answer on that because I don't. We don't. We're not an MSP, so we haven't gone out and, and checked all the latest cool stuff that's available now. As I would love to, but um, but I've got no need to now because I don't have to go and look at it for clients. Um, I think the ones that I've seen there. the most popular one, Mimecast. I think by far from from what I've come across. Mine, yeah, that's the other um, one that I've, I've seen a, a a bunch of people mm. talk about. Uh, also, I see, also yeah, got I see Bruce and Matt are on mine. Yeah, I was going to say Bruce and Matt are on my wavelength. Look at that. We use, we use as much M365 as <laughs> possible. ATP. Go team. Yeah. Go yeah, team. Yeah, I just, um, all I want is, hey. is ATP to speed up the link clicking URL, redirect URL on their, their email um, thing. I don't know. What's it called? Safe links or whatever it is. All Safe I want links. Them to do yeah, 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 yeah. Is speed up that. Do you find it as a delay? Oh, five seconds minimum for us. No way. Right Every single click is I five seconds that, minimum. It has been for I years. I wonder if that's an infrastructure thing for like your local it data center or whatever. Yeah, it could be a local Australia. We yeah, we yeah, we don't get that here. Right. Yeah, maybe it's just us Aussies. But, uh, but it happens from everywhere. To stay off the Microsoft bandwagon for a second. Yeah. But Mimecast is good. We see that in a lot of enterprises. The one cautionary tale I would say with Mimecast is if you use it for email archiving, or if you as an MSP come across yeah, yeah. clients on Mimecast and you're thinking of moving them to something else and they're on email archiving, forget about it. Because the, the data exit charges to get the data archive out of Mimecast are very expensive. And then the data ingress charges to move them into whatever platform you want right. to move them into are also very expensive. So if they're oh, on oh, Mimecast man, I, and they're archiving, I found Mimecast was actually there. really um really affordable. So we, we had one of our clients that had an archive in something else. And we moved yeah. it into Mimecast, and and the cost to get it out of their system was like <laughs> ten to fifty times the cost of Mimecast's cost of getting it out. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, yeah, yeah. That, that it's it's insane. We've seen because like you've had people that are there for like five years or whatever, and you're like, okay, let's just mm. export this. Yeah, that'll be ten thousand pounds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And and is that going to come out in a native format that I can then ingest? Sounds like a oh, ransom, no. nearly, right? Let's, let's just no, no, yeah, no. We had a. <laughs> 50 or, I think it's 50 or 60 grand um, bill to get it out of what? somewhere. Good hey, lord. Goodness. I won't say the product hey, name, but they, they hey, know hey, how hey. to sing their client. R Richard's just called out in the chat box that we've got Drop Suite, and that's who we use in Drop the tech Suite, tribe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we, we use, um, we use spanning yeah. backup internally because we're a Google shop because we dropped right. the, the Google yeah. Kool-Aid uh, years ago. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, Scott's like, Bleh. But uh, yeah, so we used uh, spanning backup, but we, uh, if look, Scott's actually walked across, is that walked away? Is that offended that I'm using? I've, I've walked away, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we used spanning backup, which was acquired by Casair, but we recently moved across to Drop Suite, um, which is offered by Pax8, I think, in uh, right. um, pretty globally and certainly here in the UK. Super, super simple. Awesome, and this is right. you know, the reason we moved across is the simplicity. Yeah, you know, if we, I don't want to be the person within our business who has to do any recovery or anything else. 
the team can go and do it. It's that simple. It's like when, you know, the team are not IT professionals, they can just go and do it. So I think simplicity is the key here. So big shout out for Drop Suite. Yeah. Um, I want to move on very briefly because we've not got a huge amount of time left. Yeah, um, sure. So covering the other topics, so backup, I mean, uh, there's no point in going through the backup oh. providers because there are just so many of them out Billions. there. We know all the big names. Device protection is an interesting one. Is that more, um, Scott, I think when you're writing this list, is this more the kind of MDM stuff? Yeah, MDM or MAM solutions. So whether you're using, again, if you're in 365 world, there's options there with Intune and Endpoint Manager. Uh, but there are, you know, MAS360, there, you know, there are, um, what's VMware's, uh, my brain just went blank. Um, but yeah, you know, I think getting control of business data on corporate devices is still very important because, again, it'll usually be, hey, we're a Windows shop and everything's on Windows and so we protected everything. Cool. Oh, but there's just there are two Macs in the business. Oh yeah, Who, who's got the Macs? Well, it's the CEO and the FD. Of course it is. Of course so it's it is. the two people who've got the most sensitive <laughs> data. data. Yeah, they won't use Windows. Yeah, of course <laughs> they won't. Yeah. Um, and, and are you doing anything to protect the data on that? Well, it doesn't really fit in the Windows ecosystem. Okay, you you need <laughs> AirWatch was the VMware one. So you need you know AirWatch or Mass three hundred and sixty. Um, you need something like Jam F to get it integrated. Um, so just. Just be aware that you know we can't just again go. Well, it's not Windows, and so it's a special case, and we'll just make an exception. We have to be taking control of the data on those devices too. Um, so yeah, yeah, just those things really come to mind. As well as I think we also talked about end user security training, end user awareness. So whether that's you know no before or people like that, it, it's got to be accessible. It's got to be interesting because. The people who sit in accounts and do accounts all day aren't really interested in cybersecurity. They're really good at doing accounts. Um, so I think there's there's lots of stuff there that we've got to really get the team engaged. The whole right. business needs to be cyber aware, not just the techies. One of one of the things that I want to like we're talking about all these vendor categories that we're, we've got there like AV and and backups and whatever. But one of the things that that often goes missing in a in a an MSP vendor stack is the catch all option the insurance option. Like if something does get yeah. through all of those layers and makes its way through, what's your catch all? Like what is your, what is your default option? And, and I think it was, was it Bruce who mentioned, he asked do, do all MSPs have cyber insurance out there. My answer to that is yeah. a straight up no, nowhere near enough MSPs have cyber insurance out there. And MSPs are at the point where they're kind of struggling to get cyber insurance out there now because all the cyber insurance companies are, are increasing the level of um, requirements that they have for you to be able to, or to be able to write a plan because they've, They've lost so much money over the last couple of years in payouts out there. And to me, like one of the fundamental things you need in your stack is to make sure that you have got some coverage, not only for your own sake, but for your client's sake and your staff's sake and everything in there with business interruption, with PR, with legal, with compliance, with all of that sort of stuff in the event that something gets through all of those layers of your stack and get makes their way in. And, um, and I think that's one I mean that... Sorry, who was saying something then? I was going to say, we, oh. we do, we do have that, but it wouldn't cover our clients. So we have that right. as a yeah. as an MSP, but it, it, it does not cover your, our clients. Yeah, it doesn't extend yeah, down so, to No, so we would have like um, professional indemnity and public liability insurance that would mm. then, you know, if we'd right make a, a configuration error and that caused a breach, then... And I, I'm assuming, genuinely, I'm assuming that then it would be it would fall under our professional indemnity and public liability insurance. You know, if, if it would be one of those, <laughs> our cybersecurity insurance is if you know we lose some of our data or whatever, then yes. that's yeah, where yeah. that's where we can claim. What the, it was one of my points actually is I think we need to be encouraging the customers to have cybersecurity right, insurance. Yeah. Again, it's part of that conversation that says, hey, if you get hacked, I'm not insured for that. You, you can't claim off me. You need your own insurance. And it's just, again, being really clear about where the lines are Where the lines are drawn, people. yeah. And understanding yeah. where the lines are drawn. I would say most MSPs I speak to don't know where their line is drawn. They don't know where their liability ends and and, be, and the client's liability begins. And, and it's all gray. And even their, they talk to their broker and their broker, it's gray answers that come out of their broker. It's kind of a moving space like crazy at the moment. But, uh, but you've got to be... Richard's saying, yeah, like partner with a broker. A good broker is hard to find. This for when we were recently yeah. doing our, or it's 18 months ago now, redoing all of our PIPL and, and cyber insurances. It took me seven different conversations with brokers until I found one that could actually uh, answer the tough questions that I threw at them around where those lines were drawn. And I finally found one and I've, I've put a number of MSPs onto them now and they're all coming back going, holy crap, this is like a breath of fresh air dealing with this versus my current brokers. But finally, there is, right? yeah. And um. 
because it, it's an unsexy industry, right? Like it's hard to find people that, that want to get in and get excited about this stuff. We've got an amazing guy in the tribe, Joseph Brunsman, who uh, has got his own brokerage firm over in the US and looks after looks after it over there. And this is the kind of guy that geeks out as much as about insurance as we do about and cybersecurity insurance specifically as we do about MSP stuff. He's written books like this thick on on how cybersecurity insurance can be handled and he's the kind of guy that you want on your team when you're you're going and trying yeah. to figure your stuff out give, give a shout out we've we've mentioned him on um uh, these events before but uh trevor cornbill of tech insurer in the uk uh, right. for those of you yeah, watching right. from the uk trevor is, is at all the comp tier events he's embedded right. in the msp right. industry really knows this stuff so he's not like a broker who just happens to do cyber security he's a cyber security specialist yeah, he's so, the joseph uh, brunsman of the uk <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And Lee, I, Lee, I love Lee's the, comment um, in here. Insurance. Oh, sorry. What you go? When you trying to get your client covered with cyber insurance, the thing I find is that going back to that discussion of where well, you need like the basic, but you know, basic stuff covered, the base mm. layer of kind of products and, and services, you need a, you need that in place anyway because the insurance companies won't cover you. We'll, we'll say no. Yeah. Like, yeah. This, so you do you have that protection? Well, no, we don't. Okay, we can't cover you. Or you, you obviously, insurance premium goes goes sky high. Um, so it's worth kind of tying those two things together and yeah, obviously recommend it to clients. Absolutely. But just, you know, explain to them that you're going to have to at least make a, a noticeable effort to try and protect things first before you just rely on that insurance thing, because oh, course, yeah. everyone's out there going, oh, it's never happened to me. Like been in business for 10, 15, 20 years, it's never happened to me. It yep. always is going to happen to you at some point. It's, and, it's never a question of it. Do you think the person that got breached yesterday was saying the exact same thing as you the day before? That's the Exactly that. Exactly yeah. that. Um, so, well, yeah, when you're having those discussions with clients, absolutely make sure you've got that basic level of protection in place or, or they'll just get screwed on pricing and, and won't get covered anyway. Yeah. And, and the, the good thing is um, in a lot of instances is that when they do have that conversation with the, the insurance and you might assist them through that conversation and the insurance company starts asking these questions and they realize that they're failing on those points. Um, it becomes a shopping list for you guys as the MSP out there to, to go and, and know that the, for the client to come to you and say, okay, like, these are all things that now the insurance company has said that we're not getting insurance till we deal with these things. It's kind of a third party validation of the things that you've probably been telling them for a long period of time, but has now become an actual official shopping list for you to go in and actually do uh, because they've, someone else has validated and told them to go and do it because they're not going to like, they're, they're have, going to have a massive amount of risk in their business if they don't. <laughs> Although and I like, and that's why it's also, I was going to say, that's why it's also important that you build out your stack properly because you don't want to be the MSP that's gone in there, done your thing. They go for insurance and then they go, well, why can't we get insurance? We've got everything you've told us that yeah. we need. Like, why can we not get it? Oh, well, we've kind of missed something. That's yeah. not a fun discussion. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, Lee's catch all is to put the kettle on and have a cuppa and <laughs> put his feet up. And <laughs> I love it. Sometimes you got to, like, you do it as much as with this stuff is all so ridiculously serious and we've got to take it so seriously. You've also got to, you've got to keep an open, positive mind through it because it will drain you and kill you and drive you stark raving mad trying to deal with it all the time. And you've got to, you've got to approach it with a, a, a sense of possibility in there because otherwise you won't approach it at all and you'll be, you, you, you'll run away from it. So I love Lee's kind of, it, it might be a throwaway comment, but it's true. You've got to, you've got to laugh about it. You've got to laugh with your clients about it. You've got to bring down those barriers to have the right conversations with people and make it so that it's not this fear, uncertainty, doubt conversation. It's actually a real risk conversation with humor and with personality and with grace and whatever uh it so so that you get the best results out of it so thanks lee for bringing some fun to the horrible bloody conversation and a horrible bloody topic um what are we we're nearly at time bruce, there was one other comment i saw in there that um oh yeah bruce saying you just need bruce. to have your t's and c's nailed though and um and it's so true there is so many msps out there that still haven't got signed terms agreements with their clients they just they're, they're, it's a handshake deal out there and and when push comes to shove um, you, you, you don't need terms and conditions until you need terms and conditions and, and you'll never know when that's going to be. And, um, and it's one of those things that if, if you're out there as a, an MSP at the moment and you've got a team and you've got staff and you've got, you've got bills to pay and clients and suppliers and whatever, if you don't have terms and conditions in place to protect you and your business and your business's future, you are doing your, all of those stakeholders a disservice out there because you've got this massive, again, risk in your business that, that untapped and unfettered will likely send you out of business in one way, shape or form. And everybody loses out. Those clients, those stakeholders, those team, those, those teams, family members, you above all you're the one making the bad decision though so you probably should be the one that's losing out but everybody else loses out as well in that thing and so so terms and t's and c's in there are kind of mandatory in this day and age to get them in place and get a good legal to sign off on them and to to approve them and and use templates like the tech tribes one or pete's one and go and get them um go and get them in place if you haven't already it's kind of mandatory nowadays if you're not doing it you're mad and i remember i was saying to someone today 
like when I first signed my um my managed service deals in I don't know 2008 or something, it was like um the scope was we'll do your IT, you give us a thousand bucks a month, and that was it. <laughs> Shake on that, and just can you pay us pay the bill? And um and my the industry has changed since then, and but and and this other stuff, all this stuff nowadays is just mandatory. It's part of doing business. If you're not doing it, you're you're, you're digging your own grave, and you're digging it pretty deep and it's going to be pretty soon when you fall in out there um right have we missed any other questions i'm i'm ranting on that stuff because i love talking about it and i hate talking about it as well but i, I love talking about it because i just think it's one of those things that everybody needs to like seriously take seriously far more than what what the general consensus is or the general industry is out there um barry says what was We've the full one question in chat um oh, oh yeah um, okay, I'll, I'll do I'll just quickly to John Theo's. He said, "Does Cyber Essentials certification not allow for insurance?" It does. In fact, if you get your Cyber Essentials in the UK, you will get a basic um, cyber insurance uh, nice. policy along with that. Uh, so that's good. Again, a really great reason for people to go ahead and do that. And so again, you can encourage your customers to get through Cyber Essentials, which is really easy. Um, and again, if you partner up with an agency that does those assessments, even better. Um, so yeah, definitely do that. And then yeah, the full list for product stack that I had. Okay, in my brain, I wrote down. <laughs> let me, let me, I'm just going to go to the document because that'll be easy. Well, while you're doing um, that, um, I got oh, it. I was well, just, yeah, found go. for you. But yeah, I was just going to answer that. Um, Barry, Jennifer Bleem um, from the US also did a little training inside the Tech Tribe, yeah. maybe six months ago, called the Cybersecurity Stack Builder. I think it was. It was something similar yeah. to that. If you search for it inside the Tribal Library under Expert Workshops, you will find it. And um, because I'm I'm 99.9 percent .9 certain you're in the tech tribe, Barry, and she did a really good training of how to align that that stack with a, a NIST framework style approach in there, and and all the different vendor type partners that were in there in a visual layout, which was really good. Um, Ismail saying I love that course. Thank you, Ismail. But it's yeah. in there as well, Barry. If you haven't seen that, but sorry, back to you, Scott. I was just pointing out a resource. no, no. It's it's a it's a really great one. I was going to call it out myself because I I really enjoyed that, and uh, I'll do a terrible impression of it right now. <laughs> um, but essentially, so uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, which you need to cover. You need web <laughs> sorry web filtering and web content <laughs> filtering for the devices, um, email hygiene and backup and content filtering and URL protection and safe links and document scan and all that stuff under email hygiene. You need some kind of backup for the files, folders, emails, even if it's just inside 365. Air you might also want some disaster recovery. Uh, yeah, ideally air gapped as well, yeah. You might want disaster recovery if you have any servers or on-premise servers or servers in the cloud. Device protection for when it comes down to, you know, bring your own device, uh, mobile app management, mobile device management. Um, you want uh, antivirus, anti-malware, you know, uh, EDR, ideally, on those uh, endpoints that you're managing. Um, and then you would want some end user training. So basic security awareness training for everyone in the organization, not just the techies. So that, that would be my basic security step. I'm going to throw in two more um, if I can into the mix there as yeah. well that, I, that I'm big fans of. And that's application whitelisting. So we're big fans of that. We've run application whitelisting yeah. on our whole stack. And um, yeah, yeah. and persistent threat hunting, Huntress, like as a perfect example, like yeah. just getting in and for the things that get past everything, get past the AV and get past the firewalls and get past everything and, and put this persistent threat inside or persistent tool inside your business. You want to figure out whether they've got in and, Tools like Huntress are awesome at that as well. So I think application whitelisting and some sort of persistent threat hunting or, or persistent foothold hunting are two things that, that are, to me, in the basic, they should be in basic stacks around the place now as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not uh, forgetting Richard. the really obvious one of good patch management. Yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't forget the basics that our industry was built on, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, here we go. Ismail saying, would be great to have a section in the TTC for MSP stacks, essentials, advanced and premium. And that's, I, I would love to build something like that. It's so darn hard because of the, the, the industry, how fast it changes and how different all the, the, the local um, frameworks are around the world, like NIST versus Essential 8 versus Cyber Essentials versus everything. So I'd love to do something like that, but it's, it's kind of one of those things you'd put 100 hours into building it and then six months later, you have to rebuild it from scratch and you go, ah, crap. Uh, it's, it's kind of one of those things you, you just align with one of those frameworks, make sure you keep up to date with it and just continually improve is the thing with a tech stack and a cyber stack is just always be working to improve it, always be adding something each month or tweaking something each month or improving something each month or even week in there to, to keep continually adding to it because the guys on the other side are, <laughs> you've got to be, if you, if you want to keep in front of it. Um, yeah, and password manager also, Jorgen says in there, um, 
highly yeah. important and one that, that's only started to be used by MSPs recently when there's been those MSP friendly password managers out there that can be resold out to clients and managed in a multi-tenant state. So um, definitely, yeah. we, we probably should have called this this particular one the cybersecurity stack planner, this, this call. <laughs> We probably could do one a little bit deeper down the track and um, and whatnot. I know we're near the end of it. Does anybody, did we miss any questions or does anybody have any passing final thoughts they want to throw in before Pete does his awesome? I think so. Just up? throwing some names in for, um, if you don't want to deal with it yourself, where can you go? Who are the vendors you yeah, can talk right. to? You can just do the whole, that whole thing. Uh, Bruce, in the US, one of the yep. guys that I, I'm hearing lots of amazing reports about is Bruce McNally. He's written a book, which um, it is, don't tell me I don't have it on my desk here. I wish I did. Um, hang on one sec. You guys keep talking. I'm going to find it because I really want people to go and grab a copy of this book. How about the UK companies? Scott, Richard, have you got any uh, connections with vendors? Yeah. Uptime Solutions. Uh, are so the vendors. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say Uptime and Insoc are the, the, the main Insoc. people that I would think of for that. There's obviously Continuum, although... I haven't heard the best reports about them since the the acquisition and the integration. Um, but yeah, definitely in SOC and Uptime. Um, uptime would be my absolute favorite, <laughs> given that they're a fantastic <laughs> partner of ours right now. And I think they, um, Inbay as well as another one. Let's throw, throw their hat in the ring. Yeah. Um, here's this book. Um, for and, and Damien's just mentioned it as well. Thanks, Damien. But it's called Level Up, and and it's written by Bruce McNally over in the US. He runs a, a, a service to help MSPs level up their security operations and help them get their stack in place and whatever. And this book, like looking at the table of contents in this thing, is it's just the kind of table of contents you want to read. Like why you need protection, your cyber stack, just in time documentation, passwords, cyber liability insurance policies, tabletop exercises firewalls website hardening ad hardening preventing lateral movement bypassing av like all the stuff we're talking about right and this is all the stuff that an msp really needs to be on top of this book here 200 pages i'm a firm believer that every msp in the world should go and read it and um right. and you most of you will probably know 80 90 percent of it out there but it's that final 20 percent that's just going to throw those extra seeds into your, your mind of those things that you might be missing out there and let's face it Every MSP is missing something out there. And so highly recommended going and grabbing that as well. It's a such an awesome overview of this space. And um, he's done such a great job of kind of breaking down the MSP's roles and, and just the way to think through this stuff. So shout out to Bruce. There you go. That's all from me. Oh, it, I'm done. I, was gonna say, <laughs> I can shut up now. Bruce. Bruce's book is on Audible. Now he's speaking my language. I'm, uh, I'm buying oh, is it, it, it now. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> very good um i think we're done i'll hand it over to you pete you can you're you're awesome at yeah absolutely yeah thanks, I'll, I'll keep talking well, for the thank next you everybody hour. for today thank you for turning up thanks for everyone watching and listening and all that kind of thing we are always on all the podcast platforms now apple itunes spotify stitcher i, I don't know what those android kind of things but we're on all the platforms <laughs> of the youtube if you're not already subscribed to the youtube channel then do down always go the wrong way that way in the corner here if you're watching this and um yeah, make sure you go to youtube.com slash the tech tribe for the YouTube channel. Um, head to down below the description. I think there's a link for 40% off your first month for tech tribe. So if you're not already signed up, then then do sign up. It's definitely worth having a look at. And we are taking a break. I believe we are taking a, is it two week break? Three two week weeks. break? I think we're... Yeah, two weeks. We we haven't decided on the third week. It depends on on how relaxed we all get over the, the holidays, I guess. <laughs> we'll, um, we'll either take the next two Thursdays off. And if we're not around the Thursday after, it's because we all decided to take that one off as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so Scott's got his pickle thing. I've got my, we were talking about this off air, but I've got my Grinch thing here because I am Christmas Grinch. So I'm getting ready and prepared for Christmas Grinch. So I, th I think if there's anything I could say just to kind of leave on is that certainly of the people that I'm speaking to and I'm going to speak to you today because this is my coaching day is try and get some time off over Christmas. There are so many people I'm speaking to where all the clients have turned around all of a sudden gone, oh yeah, let's go ahead. Like we've got, mm. we can close down for Christmas. Go ahead and do the work. It's like, <laughs> that's fine. But make sure you don't run yourself into the ground. Make sure you're taking time off. Just try, like, Christmas is like the one time in the year that you can probably just switch off for those few days, at least over Christmas, and really relax and really enjoy yourself. So don't feel like you need to work through it. Um, take the time off. Use it as a bit of a, like a mental kind of getaway and just enjoy yourself. That, that, that's the main thing, I think. Just get the time away. Pete, can I add to that? just as a soapbox moment, just to finish off on, because I'm a big believer in taking time off and relaxing. If you are coming to Christmas and you're about to collapse over the finish line and you and your team are exhausted and you're using the Christmas period as recovery, you need to build more recovery time into 2022. 
because Christmas shouldn't be a time where you're literally like, oh my God, I get two weeks now to recover before the next year starts. You're working too hard. You need to take more time off. And so I want you to use the Christmas period to plan more time off for 2022 and beyond. So there we go. And I like that you mentioned for you and the team. I guess a, yeah, a group effort. We just uh, we just ended sending up these planners. I was, I was talking about them like was it last week, the week before? Um, I've just sent these planners out to all of my um, coaching clients. Uh, I don't know if Scott, you might have already have one or not, but um, that's fantastic because you can go through, you can plan your weeks, plan your months. It's such a good thing. I'm starting to do it as well. So yeah, I agree with Richard. Just take your time off, plan the next year. Seg- going back to our kind of first with the first or second one, productivity. Just like book your time in. Make sure you're not overstretching yourselves whatever you need to do. And obviously chat to any of us. We're all around on LinkedIn and Tech Drive and anywhere else, all the social platforms. If you need help, then, uh, then reach out to somebody. Agreed. And with that said, with that thanks said, for watching. Thank you everybody <laughs> in the chat rocks for sharing all the wisdom and comments and, and links and, and stuff. With that said, I'm going to click the end stream button and see you all in 2022, isn't it? Um, yeah. Have an amazing break, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for playing along with this experiment for this year. It has been fun. We're starting to get a little bit of traction and um, and it's just fun to have a chat about this stuff that we're all so passionate about and we've all got our not so humble opinions about all these things, which I, I love. So thanks for coming along for the, the journey, guys, uh, both you three and um, everybody in the chat box. And we will be back uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Merry Christmas. I'm yeah, out of here. Merry Christmas. See you guys. Bye.